I think any person, especially women, who post a selfie get made fun of for it. Uh, or like get judged for it. Like mm -hmm. if you're seen taking a, this happens to me all the time. Like I'll be taking a selfie. I'm trying to explain why people shouldn't inject their penis with stem cells, and which I think is important. And like you can see people looking at you. I've had people walk by and be like, oh, like such an important picture. You know, they're just making talking down and condescending to right. you because you're doing that. Um, Meanwhile, they have like 11 followers. <laughs> what's beyond that? It's also like we are visual people. Right. We want to connect with other people. We have a whole gyrus in our brain of recognizing faces. Yeah. Clearly that resonates. And if that's the way I'm going to connect with someone so that they'll trust me. Scientists have this huge mistrust problem as we discussed. And so if by showing my face and being transparent, I'm like, hey, I'm a person that you can relate to. Here's what I look like. I think that can be really powerful. That's Samantha Yamin. She's a PhD candidate who's studying stem cells in the brain, but more people are likely to know her as Science Sam. She's a Toronto-based social media creator whose content gets more than 700,000 views a month. We had a really great chat. We talked about some of the challenges facing women in science. Uh, we talked about how to take better care of your brain, life after death, how to build a strong social media brand, and much more. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Samantha Yamin. So thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me here. I know you're super busy, so uh, I really appreciate the time. Um, I wanted to start out a little bit with how you got into the field that you're in. Um, you know, my daughter, I asked my 13-year-old daughter for some questions for you. She was checking out <laughs> online. She's following you now. So um, she wants to know, first of all, who were your inspirations or and, and was this a, a moment or a process? Like, was there some moment from your childhood that you said, this is what I'm going to do with my life, or was this something that gradually kind of occurred over time? I'd be interested to find out how you got into that. Yeah, so I guess the interesting thing is that I kind of wear a few hats. So my, my, like my day job is, you know, do finishing my PhD and being a scientist. And then I've started doing this science communication stuff on social media, which is probably what your daughter might care about a little bit more. Right. Um, and so each of those two different jobs have kind of um, been inspired by different things. So I'm guessing you're more interested in the social media stuff. Well, no, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I was talking first about about the science and stem cells and brains. Yeah, okay. Like, okay, so, cool. so uh, is that something where you five years old and said, "I need to work with brains"? Or what okay, so happen? weirdly, yes, kind of. <laughs> so um, I, it's kind of a it's a cliche story. I was just a curious, super curious kid, and I was lucky that you know my parents fostered that nerdy side of me, even though. You know, no one else in my family did science, but they, they were like, cool, this kid is curious. Um, I think when I was 14, I stayed home one night and was Googling, like, brain, science, job, and came up with the word neuroscience, and I was like, cool, mom, I'm going to be a neuroscientist. Really? And she's like, okay, sweetie, sure, whatever. <laughs> go go ahead, you can do it. <laughs> um, and then I kind of been set on doing research since then, so it's kind of weird to decide when you're 14 because you really... You shouldn't be deciding when you're 14. Right. Um, but I was just really, I had a lot of questions about the way people worked. I was like really interested, really in psychology. Like, why do people behave the way they do? Um, so I kind of decided from a young age, I'll probably go be a scientist and study brains. Um, then when it came to <laughs> university, I actually did that. And uh, I started studying it. I, I liked it. I had a lot of unanswered questions after my undergrad. And so I decided, I guess I'll do a PhD because I'm not done asking questions. Right. Um, and six years later, I'm here. <laughs> and, and that's so it's kind of weird. I don't recommend people to decide so young, but I think I'm still wondering what I'm gonna do with my yeah. Career. And now I'm finally starting to realize there are other things, and I think that it's a good idea to do career exploration. Um, but if you are passionate about something and that's what you gravitate to naturally, then I think you should kind of pursue that, whatever it is. Right. So you mentioned your parents. What would what would you say? is the, the most important lesson that you took from them or the, the, the gift they gave to you? Oh my gosh, I have the most empowering, uplifting parents in the world. Like, to, to a toxic point, I have so much confidence <laughs> because of them. Like, I would tell my dad, uh, oh, I have an important meeting today or presentation, and he would, am I allowed to... I don't know if I'm allowed to say. He would just be like, kick their ass, you know, like you so. Can say that, yeah. Okay, I don't know what I'm allowed to say. You can say all the stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah, they're just like very much like, well, you can do anything, and you're a killer. That's kind awesome. Of mentality, which I, I appreciate. and is that since you were uh, since you were a little girl? Yes. Yeah. And do you think that played a big role? Do you think parenting 
is a big piece in people who end up achieving great things. Like some people do it despite not having that, but how important yeah. do you think that is? I think it's one of many things that can enable you to do what you want to do. I think it was important for me. I think having parents who encouraged every crazy idea and also said I could do it, I never really thought about the social challenges that I might face that I see now um, because I wasn't raised in that environment. Right. So when I was just like learning about science from my computer, I didn't think about like, oh, there aren't a lot of women in science. That didn't consider that. Right. Uh, now that I'm in it and I'm seeing more than just my family, I'm right. realizing, oh, there are bigger challenges. So, but I didn't so have an idea of that. That's that's the next thing I want to jump on. Yeah. You you mentioned recently somewhere, I forget where it was because you're all over the place. <laughs> But it was the, the lack of, of female role models in, yeah. in what you do. And at, at, what, at some point, is that kind of, uh, is, that, is that concerning? Is it troubling? Because like, everyone wants to look up to someone like, that's who I want to be like, or that's the, the role that yeah. I should, the path I should take. What's it like when there aren't many people there? It's, it's confusing because you're looking at someone giving the big talk at the big conference and you're like, cool, I want to do that. And let's say you network with that person. At the end of the day, you're going to have unique challenges, whether you're a woman, whether you're from a certain underrepresented group, or you're mm -hmm. a newly landed immigrant in the country. You're going to have some unique challenge, and if you're not seeing someone who share those challenges, who are you going to ask for mentorship advice? Who's going to really be able to, not just someone to look up to, but like champion you and give you the advice that you actually need mm -hmm. and, and support that you need? And those are the decision makers as well. And if they're not informed about your unique challenges, then the people making decisions for your life aren't thinking of your real challenges, and that sucks. Right. So, so where are you right now? Like, bring us through. Um, what are the next steps for you when you're done your PhD? What's the plan after that? Yeah, so um, I'm looking. I'm on track to finish my PhD by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So let's see if that happens. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Uh, then. I've recently decided that I think I want to um, do science communication full-time, uh, whether that be working full-time or part-time with a digital media company or doing it on my own. I think both could be really fun, and, and uh, I'm really excited to... I'll probably do a mix of both, to be honest, right. because that's my... So science communication, <laughs> you, you, that's two different parts of the brain, right? Like, yeah. You're obviously <laughs> the expert, but my understanding is that the, the skill sets are different parts of the brain, and you are there's a very short list of people who can bring that together in a, in a cohesive way. So when did the communications piece become so big to you? And I want to get yeah. into the whole Instagram and... Sure, and, yeah. and, and uh, you know, was that by design, or did, <laughs> did you just kind of get this following? I'd be interested to find you got, like, what, 15,000 or so cool. followers on Instagram, right? So yeah. what was the story that, like, how did those two worlds kind of combine for you? Yeah, I've, I've always really had a passion for teaching, and I've always been pretty social. So I think that, and I think it's actually key that nobody else in my family did science, because I've always had to know how to explain it right. if I ever wanted to talk about my day, which... I did because I'm chatty. Right. So uh, I think that was actually, I think I was having training from a young age because I cared about things no one else cared about in my life. So, sure. Um, uh, and, and actually I'm part of, you know, the philosophy I have is that science being a publicly funded endeavor isn't finished until it's communicated and shared. Because if we're using public money to do research and then keeping it to ourselves, that's kind of sketchy. So I think that communication needs to be more um, ingrained in scientific training. But you're right that right now it isn't. And we're not even good at communicating to each other, let alone. Right. Do you think, and, and you know, my, my point earlier about the two different parts of the brain, do you think it's yeah. because scientists, and, and this is obviously generalizing, are not great communicators? Do you think I think there's... a lot of people aren't great communicators. Okay, well, <laughs> including, I mean, I'm sure you would agree. That's my, that's my whole job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how you have a job. Thank God, thank God they aren't, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I don't think it's unique to us, but I think it's definitely true that it's never emphasized, and it does take a lot of thought. You you have to be thoughtful about communication and about your storytelling, and I don't think we ever make the time because we're never taught to. Right. Um, I'm lucky. I'm in a lab where my supervisor, he will rip you apart in a practice presentation before your real presentation, right. which I love. Um, so he's really helped us to become better storytellers. preparing you for the real world. But he's unique in that he cares about the story of your right. talk. Most people just care about showing as much data as you can to show off that you're such a good scientist. But we're not in, we're not in a world that appreciates data. We have like five seconds to consume something. I know. But in, in science, like you'll give a talk, and like an impressive talk is someone who goes through 30 slides in a 12-minute talk, and you're like, 
but what? What's the point? Versus yeah. my supervisor's like, 12 minute talk, if you have more than eight slides, you're crazy. It's too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, he'd rather, he talks with just one. Right. Just like, <laughs> Which I think is insane, but. I guess um, everyone plays to their strengths. Yeah. Okay, so I want to hit on a bunch of topics and yes. get, get, I want to get your unfiltered view on, on some of these things. So the other day, and they're in no particular order, so some okay. of them are a little bit weird. So the other day, um, you know, I'm trying to do some research and get ready for this thing, so I'm scrolling through, cool. and there was this article that you commented on as a public service announcement. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> do you remember? Do you know the one I'm talking about? No. <laughs> so, there's too many. So there's a story. Uh, there's a story about this guy who sort of did this thing. We're in the world of stem cells now, and so your public service oh. announcement is... <laughs> Just a friendly reminder from myself and a few scientist friends not to go injecting stem cells into your dick. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, first of all, why why are people doing this? Well, okay, forget the no. Maybe you can answer okay, that. Okay. Sorry. Um, why is this a bad idea? <laughs> And first of all, where are people getting stem cells? There's a whole bunch of questions. Okay, okay. I I want to be clear. Like, I don't blame anyone who tries anything. I think it's cool uh, to be experimental. I blame the people who are, like, pushing these ideas. Right. And, like, selling them like they're a good idea when they're not. And, like, monetizing it. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you're, like, going and being curious about trying stuff, like, power to you. I'm here to help you do navigate that because it's mm. complicated. Okay, now onto the real thing, though. <laughs> yeah. Stem cells are just, like, too hot right now. They're super sexy. Everyone's trying to monetize them. But there's only really, like, one routinely used stem cell therapy, and that's for, like, blood cancers. Right. Okay, everything else. And then there's some stuff, like, with skin that, and some stuff in the eye that relies on stem cells, but it's not stem cell therapy. Mm -hmm. So basically, no stem cell therapies are, like, everyday use. Right. But they just sound so great. Like, Joe Rogan loves them because they're like, stem cells make all new cells. If you want a bigger penis, <laughs> throw so some they, in is there. This, is, so this, is this where people are getting this? He's like one of many people. If you do a Google but search. But he's a comedian. Yeah. He's not a scientist. I mean, he's like a curious He's a person. podcaster. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah. I think I, you're a probably a little more <laughs> credible in stem cell area than Joe Rogan might be. No yeah, and, and the thing, the frustrating thing is that he has so many resources, and it's like, and a lot of followers. dude, yeah. and such a responsibility with that following. I just want to be like, dude, can you, like, not me, I'm not, like, whatever. Let, let me tell you who, though, you should be talking to. Right. Someone like Timothy Caulfield, who's, like, a very good communicator. He has a TV show talking about this kind of stuff. Right. His research is on sketchy stem cell clinics. Or okay. like someone like my supervisor. Anyways. Okay. You so where, <laughs> where where are we going? Um, so you're talking about the limit. The stem cells are very sexy today. We can't yeah. do a ton with them, but you've dedicated your career at the, at least at this stage to yeah. the study of it. So what are we going to be able to do 20, 30, 50 years out? I do think there is a lot of genuine hope for stem cell therapies. There are over. Um, even in, in Canada, I don't remember the number, but there are a ton of stem cell clinical trials going on related to multiple sclerosis, related to many blood diseases. Mm -hmm. um, there are some in all parts of the world about the eye, some for spinal cord therapy. They are There is a legitimate um, case that stem cells will help any injury or disease where you have a loss or misfunction of cells. Right. My research is even doing work in diabetes to replenish the cells that aren't working well in, in the pancreas. Um, I think it's all very sound. It's just, if you want that to be a safe thing where the person doesn't end up getting cancer from their over-dividing stem cells, right. we need to be slow and careful with how we implement so it. So what stage are we at right now? If you had to put this on like a like some yeah. sort of time chart. Okay, so um, in terms of like the, the basic biology and just understanding how stem cells work, I think we're, we're killing it, especially Canada. We're doing mm. a lot. Okay, and then... There are a bunch of phase one and two clinical trials where we're doing a lot of experimental things with a few patients and actually getting it to be routine in the clinic. We're probably like five to 10 years away or something. Mm, okay. Don't really, it's going to be different on a case by case basis. Right. But. Um, have you, have you read the book, book Sapiens? Are you familiar with I'm, that book? I know of it. I haven't read it. It's a great book. Yeah. Um, I heard the, like the author was interviewed um, recently on some podcast. I think it was the James Altucher show. Mm -hmm. And he said that we, he predicts, and the guy spends two hours a day meditating, so he has more time to think about this than, <laughs> than probably we do. But uh, I guess if you're on the New York Times bestsellers list, that affords you two hours a day to yeah, meditate. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll get there. <laughs> he, he said that he envisions a point in the next, like, let's say 50, 100 years where we will be able to make it so that people can live perhaps indefinitely, like 300, 400 year lifespans because of stem cell therapies, the ability to 3D print your own heart that your body's not going to reject. When you hear something like that, what do you think? 
I mean, I don't think anything, especially in, that's only uh, organic means of right. prolonging life, and right. maybe there will be some inorganic means yeah, computationally. You... So, sure, I, I think that's realist, or that's like p- potentially true. Now the issue becomes how accessible is that going to be, and yeah. who's going to be able who's to? Who's also do saying that? that's for like the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world? Basically, right? like every I'm doing an experiment right now that costs thirty thousand dollars. Okay, what, 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 what experiment is that? <laughs> it's trying to understand. It's not that stem cell thing from earlier. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. My actual research. Yeah. It costs a lot of money. So uh, if those, thi- if and when those things do become possible, it's going to be a, a major question of access and who right. who can actually afford those. Right. And that's also um, so. For example, there's CCRM in Toronto. They're um, committed to making stem cell therapies scalable, so that they can actually be affordable. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there, and we're not doing enough of it, but they're doing a great job. Hmm. So uh, my sister, I mentioned, is a reporter with the Globe and Mail. She's on yeah. mat leave right now, and she's kind of itching to get back to work. I told her <laughs> I was going to be speaking with you, and so I said, you know, do you have any questions? Mm-hmm. So the one thing that, that bothers her, and I, I'm guessing that it bothers you, but I'd like to get your take on this, mm-hmm. is um, she said that, and, and it was sort of a surprise to me, but she said we kind of live in an anti-science age. Oh, and yeah. I found that kind of surprising. And she, then, <laughs> But her reference was, um, the Gwyneth Paltrow's of the world, the Jenny, the Jenny <laughs> McCarthy's of the world, the, uh, yeah. the 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 belief that you know you can just go on Google and people think that they can cure ailments with uh, positive thinking and juice cleanses. Um, mm-hmm. And as you said earlier, if you follow the motiv- motivation behind this, it's typically money. Like someone's trying to sell something, and to people who are either too um, ignorant or just kind of willing to believe. So. What are your thoughts on the state of that, and how dangerous is that? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no. Uh, I feel real. This is my whole thing. I feel very passionately about this. I, I want to, again, always start by saying people who go to Google to learn more about their bodies, again, power to you. The real problem are the people putting stuff on Google and or on the Internet um, that are not founded in evidence and that are exploiting people. And I think a lot of people have a mistrust in science um, because we keep it to ourselves and we don't share and it's not transparent. Um, And there's this whole notion of like pharma being very profitable and Mm -hmm. they're not curing cancer because they want to make money. Um, I want to say that that's not true. Um, They would make money if they had a cure. But anyways, it's not true. Cancer is too complicated. They can price that whatever they want. Yeah, exactly. The the real, so people have this mistrust. I think it comes from like pharma, big corporation mistrust. I think science gets lumped into that. What we don't think about is that the people selling you these supplements, the people selling you these crystals, they're making a ton of money. And unlike pharma, they have no overhead costs because they're not doing the research that goes into making the product. A crystal is a crystal. You just make, I could make that, pick it up off the floor and it. It sounds great. It's a zero, zero investment into making that product versus Mm. every drug you take has had millions of dollars. Like billions, probably. Yeah. I was at a healthcare investor conference with all the rich guys investing their money in pharma, and the keynote said, you don't invest in pharma to make a lot of money because only 5% of investments will ever lead to anything. Go invest in tech if you want to make money, you know? Hmm. The overhead cost is not good. So I think it comes from like a bit anti-big corporation thing that science gets lumped into, but it, in reality, we need to realize that those other people are profiting off us too, so apply that same mentality in all directions. Hmm. Um, Do you think people need to be doing more homework, though? Because uh, it's not very tough to get something on the first page of Google. And to do the appropriate (laughs) research, though, would probably take two weeks. So it's it's, it's difficult. You can understand where the average person would uh, put put a search in and then end up going for one of these things. We had that case of the... uh, the child out in Alberta last year, I think it was last year or two years ago, that had meningitis, and they're feeding it smoothies. Yeah. And then, I mean, and then the guy's are trying to speak at conferences now. That's like, ridiculous. That. Do not put him... I'll go to your conference for free. Like, I'll pay. Just don't. Okay, you've got to be careful now. You're going to yeah, get yeah, no. inundated with conference... I'm, I'm, uh, no, people. so I think that... Um, so even me being... I can call myself a stem cell expert. I've been studying it intensively for six years. And I will look up these different websites promoting stem cell therapies, and it takes me you know, five, 10 minutes to even, to find the truly concrete piece of evidence on the website. I know what I'm looking for and I can say, okay, this is definitely not legitimate because of X. I don't know how the average person is supposed to do that. And I think that's where science communicators come in, where we need to be that liaison. We need to be someone people trust who they can go and ask. So I encourage people to, to come and like ask questions and then we can help guide each other to the truth because it's complicated. We live in a data rich world. Mm -hmm. Too much almost. Yeah. Okay. But I empower people, I want people to feel empowered to try to learn. I just want them to also 
be wary and skeptical of does the person giving you the information have anything to gain to gain from telling you what they're right. telling you? That's a good good question because often we don't even we don't yeah. even think about who that uh, visa yeah. bill is going to. Think of who it's coming from and are they at the end of the day selling you some supplement or some collagen powder or something? And, okay, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, we know, or your followers know a lot about your work and what you do and sort of the day-to-day and microscopes and <laughs> brains. And so w- what do you do for fun, though? Like, what, what excites you in your personal life? Yeah, um, I really love food and drink. So I, uh, for, for fun, like when I have the... What's your favorite drink? I love a, a really boozy, citrusy cocktail. <laughs> okay. do, you have, do you have a favorite? Um... I really no, they're all like weird, like the lavender hound or whatever okay, from I have no idea cocktail what bar. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're all weird. Okay. They're all weird. Um, uh, yeah, I really love food culture a lot. How I about think. music? Are you a music fan? Yeah, I'm a big music fan. I don't play any instruments, and I'm an awful singer. But Do you go to uh, concerts, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I like to. I like live music, live jazz. Um, my best friend in the lab is in a band, and I love going to his shows. Okay. Um, so stuff like that. Yeah. How about siblings? I have an older sister. Okay. Um, and so she and I share like a love of clothes and fashion as well. Um, okay. And she's the one, the source of all that. Okay. Um, That's she taught me from a young influence. age, like, you dress ugly. <laughs> and gave me all her clothes. The way so. a sister would say it. Yeah. 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 That legitimately Positive was. Positive support. Yeah, yeah. It was just like, here, take these clothes. You wow. look awful. <laughs> uh, and what age was that? I don't know. Like uh, 10. And what, what does she do? Uh, she's actually a buyer for um, the company that owns Marshalls and, oh, and cool. Winners and Home Sense. So, That's kind of cool. So, so she fashion, knows what she's talking yeah, about. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So she's got some credibility in that area. Yeah, she's awesome. Okay. Do you believe in life after death? <laughs> what a transition. Yeah, no segue. Um, <laughs> we no. go from buying from Marshalls I to d- life after death. I, I don't. I don't think so. You don't, have, you, don't, you don't have to sound sad. I don't know. Do you le- believe in? Yeah, yeah, I don't do you believe so. that after you die, you continue to exist in some way? No, because there's no evidence for it. So I guess not. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's kind of sad. <laughs> you said I don't have to be sad. My mom says it's sad too. I don't think it's sad. I think it like brings more excitement to enjoying every moment. So we put do it have. all, leave it all on on the field. Yeah, so I'm like sweet. a YOLO kind of person. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I think that there's no evidence for existing beyond our, you know, 80-ish year lifespan. Yeah. Um, and so that means you should make sure that you're doing what you want in every single moment and not just doing bullshit because you think you have to. Okay. That's YOLO. <laughs> YOLO. Oh, I Thanks, said, Drake. I you said yellow. Oh, no, okay. YOLO. YOLO, like yeah. No, I, know. <laughs> I know what YOLO is. I had to Google Now your daughter's really going to She is. <laughs> FOMO. I know what that is. YOLO. Is there anything else? FOMO? Any um, acronym? I think like Carpe Diem was the original. Yeah, no, it was, <laughs> it's from uh, Dead Poet Society. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're, we're, we're going robot as people, right? <laughs> They're going to be putting stuff in our brains. Like, we're, um, where where are we with that? You look, you have a skeptical look. I have a skeptical look. People yeah. can't see you, but they see. Yeah, yeah. A friend of my dad's had something. He's got a, a cochlear implant so he can hear. Like, you know, this okay, is very like, yeah, rudimentary, yeah. but we're, can, we're going, yeah. like, you know, okay, isn't this where we're going? Yeah, we're, we're definitely like the wearables future. Is, not even is wearables, really like exciting. injectables. Like, it's is it not going? <laughs> are we going to be part cyborg in 100 years? I feel like if you were media training me, you would tell me not to answer this, this question. Is, yeah, this is, this is not a <laughs> this media is not, training session. Yeah. This, is this is the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah, this is what you shouldn't yeah. say. Um, yeah, I, I think that the more we understand about biology, the more we can think of um, other things we can create that don't look like how our bodies look that will complement the way our bodies work. So I'm into, like deep brain stimulation so that, you know, you can help Parkinson's symptoms. So like electrode, yeah. that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, apparently stimulating the brain randomly, or not randomly, but like seemingly yeah, randomly, um, yeah. helps a lot of different psychoses to Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. Um, and I wouldn't go injecting like random things again. Let that into be the, di- let that be the takeaway. Into any <laughs> no parts, appendages yeah. should no have No appendages or organs. But I think there's exciting like um, wearable tech that will change the way we function in disease cases. Are we talking like like Fitbit kind of things or different? Yeah, beyond that, beyond that. Like people who are going to get some sort of robotic limb Mm -hmm. um, or even um, brain-computer interfacing if you have paralysis and can't use your arm 
for whatever reason. Um, I think that's you can thank your computer to do something for you. Yeah, whatever. yeah. I think that there's a lot of exciting research even in Toronto going on about that and all over the world. And I'm I'm all for it. I love tech. I think it's super cool. Okay, so what would be for the for anyone listening if they mm-hmm. wanted to take better care of their brain? And not I don't mean yeah. just go don't play NFL football and smash <laughs> it against somebody, but like in terms of like rest and eating or mm-hmm. just, or or activities. What are some things that you can do to have mm-hmm. just better brain health? I'm pretty comfortable going on the record saying exercise is basically in every for anything that you're worried about exercise seems to help so uh, regular exercise when you can Uh, I also think paying attention to your psychological well-being and like I was doing martial arts that's not great for my brain but it made me feel really good well people are not punching you in the head they they? were they were are they (laughs) yeah they were well we were doing Muay Thai so it was pretty that seems pretty head heavy yeah but it made me feel really good and so that was good for my psychological well-being uh eating healthy yeah that's great but also eating cake if that makes you feel happy is good too so I think paying attention to like genuinely what makes you happy um and exercising because that tends to make you happy so Instagram (laughs) <laughs> that seems to be your thing. Like you're everywhere, but that seems to be. And am I wrong? But that seems yeah, to be. Instagram's that's your base, my baby. right? Yeah, that that's where I think I'm more like unique. And where did that? How did that evolve? Because we all start with zero followers, right? Yeah. So how did that become what it is today? Yeah. So I never had Instagram personally. I uh, my friends would always make fun of me to get it, and I didn't have it up until like two and a half years. Was that ago. a choice, or was that like your, par- yeah, your it, parents wouldn't let you on there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little old for that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they. I was want thinking me on of there. myself. Yeah. Like um, no. Uh, yeah, it was a choice because. I was, like, pretty sucked into Twitter and Facebook, and I was like, I can't handle another platform. I'll just get sucked in. Right. And I was right. I did get sucked in. You did. Um, but my, my best friend, Michelle, uh, she's in marketing and social media marketing, uh, and she was like, Sam, like, you're so passionate about teaching science. Why aren't you using Instagram? There's nobody on Instagram doing this. Why aren't you doing it? And I was like, I don't know. Let's try it. And so I tried it. Um, she gave me a lot of advice early on that was, like, critical, um, and what, it started, what was her advice? Just to be authentic and to be yourself and to not try so hard to be Instagrammy and just to do you kind of thing. Right. Which, again, sounds cliche, but it's the best advice because people just want to connect. And this is a high throughput means of connecting. Right. Um, so, yeah, started at zero, but it was my, my friends early on. I think your friends are a great test audience. If you want to do something innovative online, test it with your safe friend group. Uh, see how they react. My friends reacted well, and then it kind of went from there. And it was mostly collaborating and cross-posting with other people that helped me to grow. Right. So it's never um, a thing you do alone. So, <clears throat> and a lot of the a lot of the images, I'd say like every third one is you, like close up, yeah. face, <laughs> smiling or whatever. So like you're the, you're the brand there. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, I did a I did a uh, an interview with a real estate agent out west, and I asked her for some Instagram advice, and she was like, she was pretty harsh. She's like, yeah, your your feed is very vanilla. And it's kind of boring. So. Oh. <laughs> It's fine. I was, I, I was asking for it, and actually was nicer than my kids say. But um, <laughs> but you made a comment recently that said something along the lines that, you know, I'm going to miss the quote a little bit, but you said um, you are either upset that, you know, women who do selfies on Instagram in the science mm-hmm. community are not taken as seriously as others. I think any any person, especially women, especially young women, who post a selfie get made fun of for it. Uh, or like get judged for it. Like mm. if you're seen taking a, this happens to me all the time. Like I'll be taking a selfie. I'm trying to explain why people shouldn't inject their penis with stem cells, and which I think is important. And like you can see people looking at you. I've had people walk by and be like, "Oh, like such an important picture." You know, they're just making, talking down and condescending to right. you because you're doing that. Um, Meanwhile, they have like 11 followers. <laughs> What's beyond that? It's also like we are visual people. Right. We want to connect with other people. We have a whole gyrus in our brain of recognizing faces. Yeah. Clearly that resonates. And if that's the way I'm going to connect with someone so that they'll trust me. Scientists have this huge mistrust problem, as we discussed. And so if by showing my face and being transparent on like, hey, I'm a person that you can relate to, here's what I look like, I think that can be really powerful. Um, and it also selfies are like the only time when people, again, especially women, can decide how they want to look. Right. And I think that's really empowering. Oh, you get to take... You're the one behind, yeah. in front of the camera. Sure. And behind it. So, um, two questions. I know yeah. you have to run. What would be your... You've seen my feed, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like whatever. But yeah. what would be your advice to take mine to the next level? 
Um, and like be just be ruthless. I don't. It's fine. Yeah. So w- what I like about your um, when we critique papers in the lab, we do one thing we like, one thing we didn't like. Okay, so one I thing I like is that one thing set, I like setting me up for the thing you don't. Yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I like your. I actually like your captions. I'll disagree with your daughter there. Other though, yeah. she sounds great in every other. Yeah. Um, I think your captions are good, especially the ones where you're talking about like some of the hardships. So like that yeah. kind of honesty and vulnerability you get in a few of your captions, I think is great. Um, I think I would just like mix up the type of picture that you post. It's pretty standard. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's what your other. So instead of always posting like people like consistency in brand, so always making it recognizable that it's your photo is good. So that's why I have a color scheme uh, and a certain like view, certain there's limited number of angles but I mix use. Mix it up. But but yeah, different thing shot in the same way. Because a boardroom gets, like, a boardroom is a boardroom is a boardroom. Yeah, or, like, show the boardroom, but can you... Different angle. Yeah, yeah, or, like, show... Yeah, show you on the Maybe way some to the of the people. Room, like, I don't show the people I if you're people. allowed. Yeah. I didn't know if you're allowed to do that. Um, I've never asked. I've been uncomfortable. Yeah, showing the people or even showing, like, the city or something. I think people just like a little bit. Mix it mix up, up a little bit. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, surpri- people like to be surprised. And the last one, this is from my daughter. Oh, yay. What advice would you give to a teenager who is interested in the same things as you? She's interested in brains. She doesn't know... Amazing. She doesn't know really what to do with that or Mm -hmm. if that's a viable profession. Um, So what would be your advice to a 13-year-old who's kind of interested and doesn't know what to do? Pursue your interests no matter what. Pursue them ruthlessly. And the more people that tell you not to, do it even harder. (laughs) That's my um, life motto. I'd also say that... um, As a 13-year-old, you are savvy being on the internet, even though your dad might tell you not to go online. (laughs) I want you to... I'm right here. (laughs) I want you to use those skills you have to help you pursue your interests. So go on YouTube and, you know, watch the fun stuff you like and then also watch educational content um, from people like Seeker and ASAP Science, um, uh, Braincraft. Like, there are so many great creators online teaching trying to teach you what you want to know and i encourage you to use your skills of the digital world to to empower yourself to learn and yes there are tons of jobs in all stem fields for everyone um so definitely don't be worried that there aren't jobs because there are and if there isn't the job that you want just create it because like the world of the future is going to look really different so just that's what i'm going to do that my job that i want doesn't exist i'm just going to make it happen (laughs) So uh, ruthlessly pursue what you're interested in and then reach out to people doing, use that social media to find people like me and like my friends doing what you're interested in, connect with us and we'll help you and nothing gets you further than knowing someone with an inside connection. I love it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Really Thank appreciate you. your time. Thanks for having me here. It okay. Was fun. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the week and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you once again to Samantha Yamin for taking the time to chat with me. If you want to follow her on Instagram, her handle is science.sam. And before we go, I'd like to please ask you to take a few seconds to go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show. We've got some really cool guests lined up for the next couple episodes. Anyway, thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next time.